Welcome to a live BYU devotional broadcast. Today, Elder Mark A. Bragg, a General Authority 70 of The Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints will address the campus community. The devotional originates from the Marriott Center on the BYU campus. Welcome, brothers and sisters, to our devotional. Today we will have the privilege of hearing from Elder Mark A. Bragg, a General Authority 70. We extend a special welcome to Sister Bragg, who is seated next to him, as well as their family members and friends who are here. Please join us next Tuesday at the same time and place for another campus devotional, when we will have the opportunity to hear from Sister Tracy Y. Browning, Second Counselor in the Primary General Presidency. Today's prelude was provided by Landon Finch, a junior majoring in organ performance from Elk Ridge, Utah, Samantha Gordon, a graduate choral conducting major from Arvada, Colorado, led us in singing the opening hymn. This morning's invocation will be offered by Coleman Weaver, a junior majoring in entrepreneurial management from Los Angeles, California. Following the opening prayer, the BYU Concert Choir will sing, We'll Sing All Hail to Jesus' Name. They will be conducted by Brent Wells, a faculty member in the School of Music, with Avery Gunnell, a junior studying piano performance from Cottonwood Heights, Utah, on the piano. And now the prayer by Brother Weaver. Our Father in heaven, we thank thee at this time to be gathered here. We thank thee to We thank Thee for the blessing to be here to hear from Elder Bragg. We thank Thee for the opportunity to to study here at this university, to be able to learn and grow, that we are blessed to study with the focus of the Savior and His Son, Jesus Christ. Father, we, we ask Thee at this time to please bless Elder Bragg, that he may be filled with the Spirit that he may know what to say and, and deliver a message we will be able to learn from and take note of. Father in heaven, we ask thee to bless us with thy spirit that we may know what to take note of and, and learn from. Father, we, we ask thee as we go about this day to, to continue on strong and, and to have thy spirit. We ask these things, these things in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen.
Thank you, BYU Concert Choir, Brother Wells and Sister Gunnell. Thank you for sharing your talents with us. You've inspired, uplift us, uplifted us, and set a wonderful tone for the remainder of the meeting. We're pleased to have Elder Mark A. Bragg as our speaker this morning. Elder Bragg was sustained as a General Authority 70 of The Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints in April 2016. Elder Bragg majored in marketing and Spanish at the University of Utah. He also completed executive education programs at UCLA, the University of Michigan, and other universities. He has served in a number of Church callings, including full-time missionary in the Monte Mexico Monterey Mission, ward mission leader, high counselor, bishop, and stake president. Elder Bragg and his wife Yvonne are the parents of four children, and they have four grandchildren. Following Elder Bragg's remarks, the benediction will be given by Joseph Walker, a junior marketing major from Holiday, Utah. And now we will have the pleasure of hearing from Elder Mark A. Bragg. <clears throat> I am very grateful for this opportunity to be with you today. Thank you for that beautiful music. Thank you to friends and family that are here. It is truly an honor. I, I mean that, truly an honor. We love President and Sister Worthen and sustain them completely. Mainly, it's a blessing to be with my sweet wife, Yvonne. I just feel more at ease when we are together. Yesterday, my three-year-old uh, granddaughter, Mila, asked me if I was nervous about today. I said, uh, no, but what, what should I do if I get nervous? And she said, just cry. <laughs> so I'm hoping that it doesn't get to that point. <laughs> I have always enjoyed studying leadership. My fascination with leadership has led me to read constantly about various leaders and leadership teachings over the years. If you look at my bedstand right now, you'll see books on political, sports, and military leaders, mostly sports leaders right now. Now, I'm going to start with a story, but please don't think that this is about me. It's not. But it is about a key lesson that I learned. May 15th, 1993 was a much anticipated day for me. It was the day of the UCLA Book Fair, and one of the speakers was Warren Bennis, my favorite leadership thinker and author at the time. I had studied his books and could not wait to hear him speak in person. I got my ticket. I arrived early on that hot day in hopes of snagging a good seat in the auditorium to, to listen to him. I even took my copy of his book on becoming a leader just in case I met him, and it wasn't too awkward to ask him to sign it. But I knew it was highly unlikely, especially as I saw the line to, to get into the auditorium grow and grow. While I was waiting in line, I noticed an elderly gentleman who seemed lost or disoriented in the heat. So I asked him if he was okay. He said he, he really wanted to see the Warren Bennis talk and didn't know where to go. And I told him that he was in the right place and the long line was to get into the auditorium. He said he didn't have a ticket, but he hoped to get in somehow. And I told him, it, you know, it's sold out, but that I would go ask if there was a possibility of a standby list or if, if he held my place in line. So the person at the door told me that there was some overflow and that the man could just go in with me. And I went back to him and gave him the good news. So when we entered into the auditorium, we saw Warren Bennis way up on the stage talking to some people. And the man said to me, let's go talk to him. And I was like, oh, no, come on, you're going to get us kicked out. Let's just sit down. But he insisted. So I followed him up, just waiting for security to tackle us. Uh, suddenly, Warren Bennis looked up and saw the man, and he hurried over and brought him up on stage, and he hugged him. I soon realized that the older man was his brother, and they hadn't seen each other for years. His brother then pulled me on stage to meet Warren Bennis. He told his brother how, that, uh, how he, I had helped him outside and that he might not have been able to get into the auditorium if it weren't for me. Completely untrue, but I loved hearing it. <laughs> Warren Bennis then hugged me and thanked me. He saw my copy of On Becoming a Leader, 
and he asked if he could sign it. Now, the point of the story is this. As he signed my book, he said something that I will never forget. He said, you know, I write a lot about the characteristics of leaders and how they need to examine their lives. I don't write as much about how they need to care for those who follow them. The first principle of leadership should always be leading others with kindness, end quote. It's easy to get caught up in self and details and administration and challenges or even vision, but in the end, leadership is about serving, teaching, encouraging, and truly caring for individuals with kindness. It's not about taking charge or being in charge, but blessing those who are in your charge. Make no mistake about it. Your loving and inspired leadership is needed in the church and in the world as we prepare for the glorious second coming of the Savior. One of my favorite quotes comes from President Howard W. Hunter. Quote, the need for leadership will increase dramatically. What is needed is not just young people of training and skill, but rather we need a generation of great faith, those who have learned discipline and discipleship. What will be needed is a generation who understand not only how to organize a, a ward, but also how to build faith, how to sustain the weak and faltering, and how to defend the truth. What is needed is a generation whose glory comes from their capacity to comprehend light and truth, who can, with that light and truth, then enlarge their capacity to love and to serve." End quote. This speaks specifically about you and directly to you. You are the generation of great faith who enter this incredible and inspiring university to learn discipline and discipleship, to go forth and to serve. And yes, this high praise comes from a diehard Ute. I expected more booze. All right, good. And a great way to learn how to build faith, sustain the weak and faltering, defend the truth, comprehend the light, and enlarge your capacity to love and to serve is to study the Savior and his teachings to the Nephites found in 3 Nephi. In all of my reading, I've never found better teachings on leadership than from the Savior himself. And I am fascinated by the first day of his visit described in 3 Nephi chapters 11 to 18. I've, I've loved studying this topic in preparation for this devotional. It's blessed me, and I, I hope that it blesses you too. I pray that the Holy Ghost will be with us to help us learn to lead like the Savior in all that we do. The heart of this talk is that Jesus Christ truly is the master leader. And in that single day with the Nephites, he taught all that anyone would need to know to be a great leader in any situation. The lessons operate on all levels. And whether in your family, in church, or in the workplace, uh, on teams, or among friends, great joy is experienced in helping and lifting others and seeing them progress and find purpose. That is leadership. The final 24-hour period of the Savior's mortal life is the greatest model of leadership by example and selfless actions in the history of the world, bar none. But I think that his first day with the Nephites is one of the greatest days of leadership teaching in recorded history. Think of it. He had precious little time, given that he had other sheep to visit. He had to be concise, clear, powerful and inspired in his limited time. So what did he do? Where was his focus? How did he teach? What can we learn about principles of leadership? And how does his leadership in that single day stack up to leadership concepts taught today? Let me start with universal leadership principles that can be learned from the Savior during that first amazing day with the Nephites. And I know, as you prayerfully study his visit, you'll find many more leadership principles. But let me suggest three. Focus on individuals. 
After bearing witness of who he was and of his mission, Jesus invited the multitude, all 2,500 of them, to come unto him one by one. That same day, he healed the sick and afflicted one by one. He later took the little children one by one and blessed them and prayed for them. He ministered to and ordained the 12 disciples one by one. No matter the size or composition of your organization, it will always be a collection of individuals. Regardless of the quorum, class, team, or organization, church or otherwise, focusing on the progress of individuals will lead to greater achievement and more joy. It applies in every setting. In church, we can think of it as looking at each individual and determining the next ordinance that they need to continue their progression on the covenant path towards eternal life with a loving Heavenly Father. Outside of church, it can mean helping into others achieve their potential. It always requires a caring focus on the one. Next, build up and teach your leaders. In just this one day account, the Savior, uh, there, there are at least 10 times where the Savior turns to the 12 disciples that he called to teach them specifically about their calling. He taught them how to do something or how they could bless the people. He modeled what they were to do. He patiently taught them how to baptize, how to bless the sacrament, how to confer the gift of the Holy Ghost. At one point, the Savior turned to the multitude and said, Blessed are ye if ye shall give heed unto the words of these twelve whom I have chosen from among you, to minister unto you and to be your servants. Can you imagine how those disciples must have felt to learn specifically about their calling from the Savior and then to hear the Savior of the world acknowledge and sustain them so publicly? As a leader, you are to lift others by teaching them what to do and, and why, and then building them up through sincere praise. If you can do that, productivity, effectiveness, growth, or any other measurement will improve. No matter where you are in an organization, ecclesiastical or professional, you can lead, you can lift, you can bless. With that focus, people will want you in their organizations, and others will want to work with you. In every calling in the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, you are called to bless others. Every leader is a teacher, and every teacher lifts and inspires others to learn more. President Hinckley taught, effective teaching is the very essence of leadership in the Church. Eternal life will come only as men and women are taught with such effectiveness that they change and discipline their lives. They cannot be coerced into righteousness or into heaven. They must be led, and that means teaching." End quote. The Savior set this perfect leadership example, and we must follow Him. Next, teach repetitively. Christ did not worry about repetitious teachings and sermons. Much of what is captured in 3 Nephi chapters 12, 13, and 14 can be compared to what the Savior taught during His mortal ministry. For example, can, consider uh, chapter 11 of 3 Nephi. Jesus teaches a baptism, and He mentions it 13 times in 20 verses. He then, as He speaks of the doctrine of Christ, He mentions it nine times in those very same verses. Think of how this repetitious teaching cements in the mind of the learner the importance of baptism in the doctrine of Christ. I suspect that there are a few reasons why the Savior taught in this manner. He taught what the Father taught him and commanded him to teach from before this world. The General Handbook states, quote, His central purpose was doing the will of His Heavenly Father and helping others understand and live His gospel. End quote. It, it just makes sense that he would repeat those lessons. In today's vernacular, we would say that he was staying on point. He knew that it would be easier for the multitude then and for us now to hear these key points of doctrine multiple times. 
to understand and to receive revelation and spiritual confirmation, line upon line, precept upon precept. Elder David A. Bednar has taught, repetition is a vehicle through which the Holy Ghost can enlighten our minds, influence our hearts, and enlarge our understanding, end quote. I have a saying on my desk attributed to Fred Smith, the founder of FedEx, and it goes, the main thing is to keep the main thing the main thing. <laughs> well, the main thing to the Savior is to bring to pass the immortality and eternal life of each one of us. He never tires of teaching and reteaching the doctrine and principles that lead to eternal life, and neither should we. Those are just three of the myriad leadership lessons to be gleaned from just a single day with the Savior. I invite you to study Christ's leadership during his visit to the Nephites, to bless you and to guide you as you prayerfully seek to develop your leadership vision, style, and abilities. So here we are, 2,000 years later, and Christ's leadership lessons have truly stood the test of time. I recently received a best practices article on leadership from Harvard Business Review entitled, What Awesome Bosses Do. On the list are the following. One, manage individuals, not teams. And it states, quote, it's easy to forget that employees are unique individuals with varying interests and abilities, goals, and styles of learning. But it's important to customize your interactions with them, end quote. Well, to me, this sounds a lot like ministering one by one as the Savior did. Number two, go big on meaning. It clarifies, quote, articulate a clear purpose that fires up your team. Set ex expectations high and convey to the group that you think they are capable of virtually anything." End quote. Well, think of the Savior, who clearly, uh, after clearly teaching the Nephites what he taught during his earthly ministry, promised that if they remembered and did what he taught, he would raise them up in the last day. That's going big on meaning. Number three, don't talk, listen. The best leaders spend a lot of time listening with their ears, their eyes, their hearts, and their minds. The Savior set this example as recounted in 3 Nephi uh, chapter 17, verses 2 and 5. Verse 2, I perceive that ye are weak, that ye cannot understand all of my words, which I, have commanded, uh, which I am commanded of the Father to speak unto you at this time. And verse 5, and it came to pass that when Jesus had thus spoken, he cast his eyes round about again on the multitude, and he beheld that they were in tears, and did look steadfastly upon him, as if they would ask him to tarry a little longer with them, end quote. He discerned that the multitude was at its spiritual and emotional limits, and he let that sink into his heart, and then he pivoted. Based on that listening, to heal the sick and to bless the little children, leaders listen with eyes to see and ears to hear while discerning needs and listening to the Holy Ghost. What did Jesus do? Now, let's move from universal leadership principles to ecclesiastical leadership principles and learn from what he did during his visit. Time won't permit an exhaustive recap of all of that that he did, but some things, and some things have already been shared, but, but here are five key actions. One, testify. After the Father testified of him, he testified of the Father and of his own role as Savior and Redeemer. Church leaders always take every opportunity to testify of the Savior in both word and deed. They never miss an opportunity to, te to testify of the hope found in Christ and through his infinite atonement. Number two, minister to the one. As mentioned, uh, there were four times on that first day that the Lord ministered to individuals one by one. The doctrine of Christ exists 
to save all of covenant Israel collectively, but it starts individually with the one. Next, invite to act. The Savior invited the people to act on what he taught. In 3 Nephi 11:41, he said, Therefore, go forth unto this, this people and declare the words which I have spoken unto the ends of the earth, end quote. Leaders always extend inspired invitations and then promise inspired blessings. Four, pray. The Savior prayed for the people, and this brought joy. The power of praying for others and letting them know that you are praying for them does bring joy and comfort and increase love. Remember this, please, in every situation, but particularly in your families. And finally, five, leave. Leaders know when to leave, to allow their people to absorb what they have learned and to apply it. It is a manifestation of the confidence that leaders have in their people if they can avoid micromanaging to allow them to grow. It is a great blessing to turn your people to the Lord and then leave and rejoice in their success. What did Jesus teach? In addition to studying what he did, it's also fascinating to see what the Savior chose to teach and how he, he focused his teachings on what matters most. He taught the importance of priesthood ordinances and sacred covenants. Right away, he taught of priesthood authority, baptism, the sacrament, and the gift of the Holy Ghost. He knew how important it was that they yoked themselves to him through making and keeping sacred covenants to have the power of godliness in their lives. And it's no different for us today. Christ taught that the uh, spirit of contention is of the devil. Not surprisingly, the adversary wants to confuse and foment contention, particularly related to the ordinances, to keep us from binding ourselves to Christ through sacred covenants. The Savior was very direct in his teaching to avoid contention, to ensure unity. He taught pure doctrine, specifically the doctrine of Christ and how to come unto him and build our lives on him so that we will prevail over this world. The Savior taught the hard truths about discipleship. He promised the soul-soothing blessings of the Beatitudes, but he also spoke of the challenging path of discipleship. For example, he taught, thou shalt not commit adultery also encompasses not looking lustfully on another. Discipleship is not easy or fast, but it leads to the most precious gift of all, that of eternal life, as families with our Heavenly Father. Surely, enduring to the end of this path is worth the journey. He taught of the gathering of Israel and the need to minister constantly without being judgmental to help in that gathering. I truly believe he taught then on that beautiful day what he would teach us today. Think about President Russell M. Nelson. Where has his focus been? What has he taught? Well, from day one, he has spoken about keeping the end in mind by entering and staying on the covenant path and keeping, making, by keeping, by, excuse me, by making and keeping sacred covenants. He has spoken consistently of gathering Israel, ministering in a higher and holier way, seeking pure doctrine, increasing unity, developing a, a do and be better discipleship, and letting God prevail in our lives, and most recently, to find rest in the Lord. You can see how he has followed the Savior's leadership and teachings in these latter days, in his talks and with each announcement that he makes. Jesus Christ is the great leader. He is the master teacher. His loving example of leading and teaching 
transcends more than just an ecclesiastical application. His leadership lessons will help you be a better spouse, parent, coach, supervisor, friend, employee, teammate, physician, financial planner, uh, missionary, neurosurgeon, or any other opportunity to interact with and lift others. Follow him. Lead like he leads. Bless as he blesses. Lift as he lifts. Love as he loves. I testify of him. I testify that he lives. Our great master and teacher. The great leader and follower. The way. Jesus Christ, our Savior. As we follow him, he will endow us with power. And we will lead in light and love. I testify that he lives. And I express my love for him by expressing my deep love and admiration for each one of you. And do so in his holy name, Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Our Father in heaven, we are very grateful that we were able to hear the words of Elder Bragg. And we are grateful for all that we've been taught. Please bless us that we might be able to become more Christ-like, develop um, Christ-like leadership in our lives, that we might have desires to serve others, that we can be more aware of their needs, and that we can receive the inspiration to know how we can best serve them. And we are grateful for Christ's example in our lives, of his leadership, and for his sacrifice. And we love thee, and we say these, these things in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. This has been a live broadcast of a BYU campus devotional. The address today was given by Elder Mark A. Bragg. Find links to the full text, audio, and video of this address within the week at speeches.byu.edu. Don't miss next week's live devotional address at this same time with Sister Tracy Y. Browning of the Primary General Presidency of The Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. And download the free BYU Radio app for episodes of the Finding Center podcast, a daily half hour of inspiration and spiritual focus. BYU Devotionals are a production of BYU Broadcasting.